Verses this morning, we're going to look at verses, um, verse 7, where um, uh, Paul is speaking about our Lord Jesus, and he says, but, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Uh, when we began this section about the humility of Jesus, starting in verse 5, we mentioned that this is a passage with deep and profound theological meaning. Um, if you do not understand this passage, there are going to be many other places, especially in the Gospels, where you hear Jesus speaking that are going to be hard to understand and hard to put in the proper uh, perspective. This passage opens it up and, and gives us an understanding about Jesus that is so crucial to us. Now, Paul's point is not simply a theological point. His point is a very practical point. He's teaching humility. And he's bringing us to Jesus and saying, Jesus had a certain mindset. He had, he had a way of thinking that is very different than the way of the world. And this way of thinking is the Christian way of thinking. It's a whole different perspective. So he, he is saying to the Philippian believers, let this mind be in you. This mindset of Jesus, let this be in you. Have this mindset. Have this way of thinking in you. And this way of thinking, of course, relates to the humility that he had been instructing them in because Jesus' way of thinking was from a humble standpoint. Well, last week we looked at verses 5 and 6 and we saw Jesus' mindset of humility, the mindset that's supposed to be in us, this mindset that starts from his position as God. He is God Almighty, creator of all things, ruler over all. So you've got to understand that in order to understand his mindset. His mindset is... Also, Jesus' mindset in his consideration, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, didn't consider it something that he would just hold on to for himself to be equal with God, to be in that position, to be in that exalted place. And we'll look at then the next step as we look in verse 7. But Jesus' mindset is in sharp contrast to Lucifer's mindset. We saw that in Isaiah chapter 14 where Lucifer was looking toward his own advancement, his own supposed superiority over others, which he felt put him in a place where he deserved to be over them and to have authority over them. In fact, to have authority like God had authority. But Jesus' mindset, this humble mindset of Jesus, starts from a position where he is already superior. He is already over everything and everyone. It's all under his control, all under his authority. But he willingly emptied himself for the sake of others and for the glory of his Father. And this is the humble Christian mindset that Paul says we are to have which is impossible without God's intervention in our life, without his salvation, because we are all naturally proud. But by the grace of God, he saves us, and he gives us a new mindset, and he gives us a capacity to be humble. Now, as we consider verses 6 and 7, or 6 to 8, really, there's, there's a, a movement taking place in, in these verses that I want you to see. Jesus, in verse 6, is presented as being in the form of God, equal with God. And so we, we see his being. We see what he is and who he is, what he is like. This is Jesus. This is a Jesus that we're looking at. This is a Jesus whose mindset we're to have but when you move to verse 7, 7 and 8 actually, 
You go from him, G, uh, Paul speaking about Jesus' state of being to him speaking about Jesus' actions, what he did <clears throat> with who he was. And so we read this, made himself, taking the form, coming in the likeness, humbled himself, became obedient. All of those are actions that he took. Actions that he took that seem far removed from who he is. His state of being, those actions should have been foreign to him. But they were not foreign to him because he was humble. Because he humbled himself. So Paul moves from Jesus' high position and privilege to his lowly and humble behavior. And it's his actions that reveal his humble mindset that is behind all of those actions. And this is the mindset that he is saying he wants us to embrace. He wants this mind to be in us. So we're going to look at verse 7 this morning. And we're going to look at Jesus' ministry of humility. Last week it was Jesus' mindset. Today, Jesus' ministry of humility. And first of all, under Jesus' ministry of humility, he emptied, emptied of personal privilege. It says he made himself of no reputation. That's how it's worded in the New King, King James Version, and I believe the King James as well. Literally, it reads this way, but himself emptied. But himself emptied. Again, the contrast, but, but. Here he is, the exalted Christ, the exalted God, the exalted creator, but, but, himself emptied. He emptied himself. This is, uh, theologians call this a kenosis of Christ because it's from the word, the Greek word, kenosis, which means emptied or drained or poured out. It's translated here, no reputation. And it's been translated in various ways. Let me give you several of those. He impoverished himself. He abased himself. He divested himself. He made himself of no consideration. He made himself nothing. He stripped himself of all privilege. He gave up all he had. He emptied himself of his privileges. I'll give you a little idea of what the, the Greek term means and what, it, what it's saying here. Jesus had everything, but he emptied himself. The idea is that Jesus, as God, emptied himself of something desirable, something that was of great value. What he did not empty himself of was his deity. Nor did he exchange his deity for humanity. That's not what, what it's talking about here, and it's not what Jesus did. Because it speaks of him being in the form of God, by very nature and being, Jesus is God, and nothing can change that. He could not be part God, and he could not cease to be God, because that's who he is. And he could not be something other than God. Although he did not and could not empty himself of his deity, whatever he emptied himself of involves his deity. So what is it that Jesus emptied himself of? What he emptied himself of was the privileges of deity. And I want you to see five privileges that Jesus emptied himself of this may not be all comprehensive and cover everything, but let's look at five of them. The first one is he emptied himself of heavenly glory. He emptied himself of heavenly glory. In John chapter 17, verse 5, when Jesus is praying to his father before the crucifixion, Jesus says this, And now, O Father... Glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus emptied himself of the enjoyment of intimate, unbroken, face-to-face -face fellowship with the Father in the glory of heaven. 
because he left heaven to come to earth. He left all the, the glory and the splendor and the wonder of heaven and the perfection of heaven to come to a fallen earth. Emptying himself of an exalted position that he had in a perfect environment that he enjoyed in heaven where Jesus was honored in perfection. It's no wonder that Jesus often said to his disciples, as he said in John, uh, Matthew 17, 17, how long shall I be with you? How, shall, how long shall I bear with you? He said that because he knew different, because he had experienced different. He knew what it was like to be in the very presence of God. He knew what it was like to be in perfection. He knew what it was like to be the highest and the most glorified being and enjoy absolute perfection. But he left that, the glory of heaven. Second privilege that uh, Jesus surrendered or that he gave up is heavenly riches. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus emptied himself of heavenly riches when he became a man. The heavenly riches that he were his and his to enjoy, he emptied himself of them. Jesus as God owns all things. Yet he emptied himself of those riches to become a man and live on earth. And isn't it interesting when he was on earth, he owned nothing. There's no record of him ever owning property or a home or anything. And even when it came time for him to die and be buried, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. He owned nothing. He emptied himself, and yet he was full of all sorts of riches. He had everything at his disposal, but he emptied himself of that. He gave that up to come to earth. Jesus emptied himself of heavenly treasure so that we could partake of heavenly treasure. For our sakes, it says it here, didn't it? Yet for our, your sake, he became poor. For your sake, he gave up those heavenly riches so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. And so he gave up, he emptied himself of heavenly treasure so we might partake of heavenly treasure, emptying himself so that we might be full. Thirdly, uh, Jesus emptied himself of the favor, favor of his Father. We, we see this happening as his, his life progresses to the cross. Early on in his ministry, in, in a couple of places, one at his baptism, the other at the Mount of Transfiguration, those in, first of all, Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, and then um, Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. We hear the Father saying of the Son, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. There was an intimacy there between the Father and the Son, and we see it demonstrated in what the Father said about the Son in those two instances. We, we also hear it in Jesus' prayers. As he taught the disciples to pray, he said, pray like this, our Father in heaven. When Jesus prayed the high priestly prayer in John 17, it was a prayer to his Father, and he would address him as Father. Over and over throughout the Gospels, when Jesus prayed, when the prayer was recorded, it was a prayer to his Father, and he addressed him as Father. But there came a point when Jesus was on the cross 
that he did not address him as father. But instead, he says in Matthew 27, 46, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There was a point as Jesus was dying on the cross where the sins that you and I have committed were placed on Jesus. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. There was a point where the Father turned his back, where the fellowship that Jesus had enjoyed with his Father forever and ever was broken. It's beyond our comprehension. But it happened. And Jesus emptied himself of that intimate relationship with his Father, enjoying the favor of his Father. He emptied himself even of that when he came to earth to become a man and when he died on the cross to pay for our sins. And Jesus actually became the object of the Father's wrath. To stand in our place, he became the object of the Father's wrath. He suffered what I should have suffered for my sin. Jesus suffered that for my sin. We often think about fairness. And of course, fairness for the individual is fairness as far as I'm concerned. For instance, it's not, it's not fair if I'm driving in a line of traffic and I get pulled over for speeding and nobody else does. But if somebody else gets pulled over, that's okay. No issue with fairness there. I just kind of go, whew. Right? Fairness is all about me. It's not about fairness. It's all about me and my perspective and, and how it looks from, from how it affects me. The most unfair event in all of history was when Jesus took your sin upon himself and died in your place, suffering the wrath of God. That was totally unfair, totally undeserved. Don't talk about unfairness in the way that God deals with you, because what you have received from God is far better than what you deserve. Amen. Jesus got what you deserved. Wow. What a God. What a Savior. This is humility. He emptied himself of this relationship, unbroken, perfect relationship with his Father. Enjoying the favor of his Father. He was willing to empty himself of that. Number four, he emptied himself of independent authority. In John chapter 5, verse 30, there's this, Jesus says a strange thing, as he did in what we read this morning, even uh, from John chapter 5. He says this, I can of myself do nothing. Now, there are many who, who will look at the subject of the deity of Christ and say, well, see, this proves that Jesus was not God. Because if he was God, he could do anything. Doesn't prove that at all. What it proves is their ignorance of Philippians chapter 2. That's what it proves. That they don't understand the Bible as a whole. They take bits and pieces and try to form a doctrine instead of taking it as a whole. Taking it as a whole, Philippians chapter 2 explains why Jesus would say that. And how that would be true of Jesus. It's true of Jesus because he emptied himself of the independent use of his authority. He refused to use his authority independent of the Father. We, we 
see a picture of that in the temptation of Jesus when the devil came and tempted him to, you know, if you're uh, the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus had the power to do that. Jesus was hungry. But he wouldn't. Why? Because it wasn't the will of his Father that he should. It wasn't the will of the Father that he should use his authority in that way. And use his power in that way. I can of myself do nothing. Yeah, that was true. Of Jesus, that was true. Because he emptied himself of the ability, the right to do whatever he wanted to do as God. This expresses Jesus' humanity. Living like God intended man to live totally dependent upon God. That's what Jesus is picturing In John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says to his disciples, without me you can do nothing. Do you know what? Jesus lived that way with his Father. That's how he lived. And even as he comes to the end of his life, in Matthew chapter 26, we know this. We have seen this many times before. As he's praying to his father, he says, Oh, my father, this is um, Matthew 26, 39. Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. It's not about my will, it's about your will, father. I, I, I have emptied myself. I've emptied myself of using my will independent. Of, of exercising my authority independently. I, I am totally dependent upon your will, Father, whatever that may be. Now, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not as I will, but as you will. In verses 53 and 54, he, he expands upon this. He says, or do you not think, talking to his, Jesus talking to his disciples, or do you not think that I can now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? I can't do that. I've emptied myself of those rights. I can do that. I can pray and I could get the 12 legions of angels. I could be delivered, but... I will not because my Father has spoken in the Word of God and the Word of God must be fulfilled. And number five, he emptied himself of divine prerogatives. Divine prerogatives. He, Jesus laid aside the independent use of his divine attributes as he submitted himself to the Spirit's direction and the Father's will. We, we read about that this morning as we were reading in John chapter 5 where Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees his Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son, shows him all things that he does, that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Jesus emptied himself of his exalted position and privilege as God. He didn't cease to be God. He had the power to exercise all those attributes because he is God. But he emptied himself of the right to do that. And he placed all of his attributes with his Father, with his Father's determination and would only exercise those attributes as God the Father chose. That's humility. Totally dependent on God. That's humility. That's what it looks like. That's what this mindset looks like. He still retained all those attributes. He still had that exalted position, but he emptied himself of it. 
They refuse to exercise any of those attributes independent of the Father's will. You see, Jesus surrendered these privileges as he submitted to the will of the Father. He lived by faith, which is exactly how we are called to live, isn't it? The just shall live by faith. We are told to believe. And not just to believe to be saved, but to, to believe to live. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You can't please him without faith. Jesus totally pleased the Father because his life was a life of faith in everything that he did. So what I want you to see here is how Jesus emptying himself is so crucial in our understanding of Jesus on earth. When Jesus says something like this, the Father is greater than I. What does that mean Jesus is not God? No, it means that Jesus emptied himself and took a lower position. That was John 14, 28. When Jesus says, I could do nothing, he said he could do nothing of himself, it's because he emptied himself of the independent use of his attributes. When in Mark chapter 13, verse 32, it, it speaks of, Jesus says that, that even he himself doesn't know the time of his return. He had a limited understanding of his return. Why? Because he emptied himself of the independent use of his omniscience. It's not that he wasn't omniscient. It wasn't that he didn't know all things. It's that he emptied himself of that, and that was all up to the Father. It's in the Father's hands. He emptied himself. He stripped himself of all privilege. He poured himself out. He made himself of no reputation. And he did this willingly of his own volition, this is true humility. Jesus deserves the highest place, but he willingly took the lowest place. That's humility. From our human perspective, we want what we feel like we deserve. Jesus instead took what he did not deserve and gave up what he did deserve. We want our way. We want our privilege. Jesus surrendered that. And he took the lowest place. He had the right to act independent. He had the ability to act independent from his father. But he refused to do that as he emptied himself. What a sharp contrast this is with Adam and Eve, who, like Lucifer, grasped for independence from and equality with God. Jesus already had independence as God. He already had equality with the Father. But instead of that, he chose dependence upon the Father in becoming a man. This is humility. This is Jesus' mindset that we are to emulate. And I'm not standing here saying, I emulate that. I'm saying here that the scripture says that is what we are to do. And so emptied of personal privilege. But he didn't just empty himself, he filled himself. He, filled, he was filled with serving others. So as he emptied himself of privilege and rights, he filled himself with service for others taking the form of a bond servant. Having, having taken, this is speaking of his coming, having taken, it speaks of the voluntary nature of this act. It, just as he voluntarily took this lower position, emptying himself, than he deserved, we too should take a lower position than we think we deserve. 
I don't know what you think you deserve. (laughs) I know what I often think I deserve. But to follow Jesus, we take a lower position than we think we deserve. This word bondservant is from the Greek word doulos and means slave. Most literally, it means slave. So as he submitted himself to his father, he became a servant of people, a slave of people. And so when Jesus began his ministry, his ministry, we see him serving people. He healed and comforted. He forgave, he cleansed, he fed, he taught. His concern was to serve other people in the best way that he could. He did that with his disciples when before, on the night before his crucifixion, they met in the upper room and Jesus girded himself in a towel and he got a basin and he bowed before them and he washed their feet as the lowest servant of the house would do. He took the lowest position among his disciples. So he not only became a man, he not only humbled himself in giving up the rights and privileges, he he continued to, to lower himself, to take the lowest position to serve others. For Jesus had said in Mark 10, 45, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And first he came as a slave of his father to do his father's will, to speak his father's words, to do what his father showed him to do. And in following the father's will, Jesus came and served others. And in fact, he has served us in the most profound way. He has served us ultimately by bearing the wrath and condemnation of God against our sin as he hung on the cross in our place. No one has ever served us anywhere near the way Jesus did when he died on the cross. This is the greatest act of service toward mankind that has ever been performed or ever could be performed. What has been provided for us through the cross is immeasurable. The blessings that we receive because of what Jesus did in serving us on the cross will go on forever and ever with no end. No one has ever served me that way. No one has ever served you that way. Taking the form of a bondservant, the Lord of all the universe, the Lord who rightfully should be served, became servant, became a slave, and he did it of his own choice. This is the mind of Jesus. This is the mindset of true humility. And this is what Paul said needs to be in us. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. A humble mindset of service, first of all, of service to the Father, of surrender to him, and of service to others, of being a slave to God and a servant of others. Choosing to suffer, to relieve the suffering of others, as Jesus has done. And so, Jesus' ministry of humility, first of all, he emptied himself of personal privilege. Secondly, he was filled with serving others. And then thirdly, coming in the likeness of a man. This is how Jesus came to us, in the likeness of a man. He he didn't come to us in the form of God. That's how God appeared on Mount Sinai. 
in the form of God. And when, when God came down on Mount Sinai in the form of God, it terrified the people. And you remember, they said to Moses, don't let God speak to us anymore. You go and talk to him. It's all right for you to be frightened, but you go and talk to him, and then you bring back his word to us, but don't let him talk to us anymore. Jesus didn't come in that form. He could have. He, he's God. He came in the likeness of men. He came as a man. If he were among us today, as he was in the first century, we would look at him, and you know what we would see? A man. So we'd see a man who needed to eat and drink and sleep, a man who could talk and hear, do all the things that, that we can do. That's what we would see. He came in the likeness of of men. For if he came in the form of God, we, we couldn't stand in his presence and in his glory. And so he put on this other form, this likeness of man. He didn't cease to be God, but he veiled his deity in human flesh. I, I, I like the way the songwriter put it. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. He became. He came in. He didn't, he didn't change who he was. He took on a different likeness, a different form took on himself a human nature. He became a man with all the essential attributes of men except sin. He became the God-man. Theologians call this the hypostatical union between God and man. Jesus came to earth fully God and fully man. Not part God and part man. Fully God and fully man. But when people looked at Jesus, they saw a man. Praise God, Jesus came in the likeness of a man. You see, if he came in the likeness of God, in the form of God as he is, we would have been consumed in our sin, or consumed because of our sin. We, we didn't need God to, to come to us and tell us we need to do better <laughs> and try harder. We needed a savior. We, we needed someone who could be the go-between, between God, holy, righteous, perfect, just God, and sinful man. You know what God's plan was? God became a man. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? God became a man. The Son of God. The perfect go-between between God and man. Fully God and fully man. You see, God could not die, but a man could die. And the wages of sin is death. God never experienced the weakness and the suffering of mankind. But Jesus became a man and experienced it all. God cannot be tempted with evil, but as a man, Jesus was. James 1.13 says that, God doesn't tempt us with evil, neither can God be tempted with evil. But Hebrews 4.15 says that Jesus was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. 
coming in the likeness of men, was God's design to bring about the salvation of lost souls. It was God's design to take sinful man and reconcile him to a holy God. But only through the God-man, Jesus Christ. Only because Jesus could come in the likeness of man and relate to men and understand men and know and be a faithful high priest who can represent them before the Father. But not, not just be a faithful high priest, but that he could be the sacrifice of that priest. <laughs> the perfect sacrifice. Because he had never sinned. He had an unbroken relationship with his father through his entire life. And the only time that was broken was when our sin and our guilt was placed upon him. Not his own. His resurrection proved that Jesus provided a, our justification. Because it proved that God accepted his sacrifice. This is humility. This is humility. This is what it looks like. It looks like Jesus. This is the mindset of humility. What does it look like? It looks like the mind of Jesus. How he thought. And it is truly incredible. Beyond words. I've, I've tried my best to convey it to you. But I don't think we even scratch the surface of the fullness of all that took place when Jesus came to earth. Emptying himself to give us the fullness of his blessings. He emptied himself so we could be full. <laughs> Taking the position of a slave to serve the Father's will and to serve people in distress. And that's how he found us. He found us in distress. In distress because of our sin. Coming as a man without sin to save those in bondage to sin. This is what Jesus did. And it all started with a mindset of humility. Being in the form of God. Didn't think it was a thing to be grasped to be equal with God. But emptied himself. Took upon himself the form of a bond servant and came in the likeness of men. We do not have a high priest, one who represents people before God, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are amazing. You are beyond words. There has never been anyone like you and there never will be anyone like you. The God-man the one and only Savior, the only go-between between God and man, the only one who could possibly reconcile us to the Father, the only one who could bear our sins in his own body on the tree and make a righteous sacrifice for those sins, a once-for-all sacrifice. And as we've looked this morning, Father, we are amazed at the humility of Jesus. The humility of his mindset that didn't grasp what was rightfully his to grasp, rightfully his to hold on to, but emptied himself and lived with total confidence in his Father. Every word, every action, every movement was according to the will of his Father. 
Teach us, Lord, this humility. Teach us to walk in this humility. To have this mindset in us. And Father, for those here without Christ, convict them, Lord. Help them to see Jesus, to see what a beautiful and wonderful Savior He is. And how fully He qualifies to save us from our sin. And how He alone qualifies to bring us to the Father. May they, by your grace and faith, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.